Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of our brand new podcast, For the Love of Reading, sponsored by Highlights for Children. I'm Christine french Cully, your podcast host, and I am a lifelong reader, made on the laps of my parents, as the saying goes, and I'm delighted to be here, and I am delighted that you are here with me. In this podcast, we find and shine a light on people who are doing awesome work helping to foster in children a love of reading. You know, all the research shows that reading for pleasure frequently tends to make us happier, healthier, and more empathetic. At Highlights, we believe that helping ignite a love of reading in kids, helping them to develop the habit of reaching for a book or a magazine when they have some downtime is one of the very best things we can do for them. It sets them on a path to success in school and, well, to success in life. Now, as we were preparing to launch this podcast, the world changed for us all and we found ourselves grappling with the spread of the coronavirus. We began the discipline of social distancing. Many of us began working at home. Schools abruptly closed, and now many parents find themselves at home with their children, doing what they can to keep their kids' minds stimulated by providing them with experiences that will keep them learning. These are challenging, uncertain times. And please let me take a moment now to express my sincere hope that all of you who are listening are safe and well in your circle of loved ones too. These circumstances were very much on my mind this week and I realized that our original launch episode, as informative as it is, might not be as immediately relevant to you as would be a more tactical conversation about reading with your kids while you're all stuck at home. I decided to switch tracks and record an episode that would help you see this time of sheltering at home as an opportunity to focus on growing your readers. I adjusted our plan and quickly called in a guest who I knew would have some great ideas for using this time of self-quarantine to help your kids get more excited about books, magazines, and story. This guest is Allison Green Myers, who, like me and like most of you, I imagine, is a big book lover. She spent half of her career as a former teacher, literacy coach, curriculum developer, and reading specialist. And today, she is a children's writer and program manager for the Highlights Foundation, working to support and nurture children's writers and illustrators. And she is passionate about growing readers. Allison is also a mom who is currently sequestered at home with her son. Allison, welcome, and thanks for agreeing to talk to us. Yes, thank you. How's it going at your house with your little guy? (laughs) Um, we're hanging in there. Um, we have definitely adjusted schedules, um, but we're finding our way. I think, um, there's a flexibility to be had with homeschooling and with working at home now. Um, we are lucky enough to live, um, in a wooded area. So we've been starting our day After breakfast, we've been going for a walk with our dogs outside and then coming in and we have our quiet reading time when we come in, almost like um, that walk is a shift in the day, (laughs) you know, from the chaos of our morning, getting up and getting breakfast and things like that. We head out the door and when we come back in, um, we're finding some quiet reading time. But today um, we had snow yesterday here in Pennsylvania. And so today when we went for our walk outside, we found bear tracks, which led us on a completely different adventure. (laughs) Uh So when we came in, we started to do some uh, online research about uh, bears and hibernation and what is it that draws them out of hibernation. And so our quiet reading time got pushed a little today. (laughs) Well, it still sounds like productive time. (laughs) A great thing to do with your kids. That was a teachable moment. You had to seize That's it, right? Right, right. Yeah. right. And, you know, we, I did say, had we been rushing out the door to school, which we usually are after breakfast, we're rushing out the door to school, we would have driven over the bear tracks. They were right on our driveway and we wouldn't have noticed them. And just to stop and kind of seize that opportunity and to talk, my guy's a, a real nature lover. And so that was, um, it was nice to have that moment. Mm-hmm. I've talked to some other parents who've said that, um, you know, even though there are new stresses associated with the stay-at-home situation where we all find ourselves in, there are also some stresses that were part of their everyday routine that are gone. And one of them is getting kids ready for school. (laughs) 
And then sort of that last hour of the day when everybody comes home, and I used to call it the breakdown lane when I was, my kids were young, you know, everybody's hungry and you're trying to transition into a family time when you've all been at your separate places with those associated stresses. Those stresses might be minimized now. Right. Replaced with some others, but um, you make a good point. We have to, you know, appreciate what's different and roll with it. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's a lot of roll with it. <laughs> There's a lot of roll with it for sure. Yeah. And and there will continue to be a lot of roll with it. Yeah. But um, what can parents do? What are some ways that they can incorporate reading into the routine of their children now that they're staying at home, uh, sheltered at home? I think, um, you know, thinking back into, I've, I've taught a little bit of everything. Um, I was at a Montessori school and I worked primarily with three to six year olds. And then um, I've taught kindergarten and first grade and third grade and sixth grade, a little bit of everything. But I always go back to the the thought of, you know, the category is uh, listening, speaking, reading, writing. And I almost saw that we forget sometimes about those first two areas being very important to the reading and writing, that listening and speaking. And I think having just really rich conversations with kiddos right now, um, noticing things in your immediate environment and maybe outside your immediate environment, that kind of uh, word building is very engaging and um, certainly helps kiddos process new vocabulary and new words and feel engaged in the conversation. Um, And I think that that becomes very important, especially when we think about like our littlest readers and trying to fathom what um, homeschooling looks like with your (laughs) three-year-old. You know, it, 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 a lot of it does end up being that listening and speaking and that back and forth and letting them just manipulate books. I mean, just holding a book in the correct direction and knowing about flipping pages, that is a beneficial reading skill. And we don't need to zoom past it because we're trying to stress ourselves into making a a reader this year. We have, you know, we, we have to stay on track. Well, some of those things, some of those foundational things I think are important. And one of the things in our house, we do a lot of talking about story. And when you talk about story, sometimes you notice it in your reading, but then sometimes you also create story and, and kids love to create their own stories and then go back and read those stories. That becomes really highly engaging. Talk to me a little bit about what you mean. Give me an example of how that might uh, unfold, a kid creating their own story. Yeah. So ABC books are great. And it's like, we all know the alphabet and we all have um, different passions. You could certainly put an alphabet book together, but a really fundamental one for little kiddos is an ABC of my family. When letters are connected to someone that you love, someone that you care about, they they become part of you. And so if the letter G is Greta and that's your sister's name, or the letter Z is Zoom Dog and that's your stuffed animal's name, then suddenly that book needs to be read over and over and over again because there are words that really connect to you. And some kiddos might even, um, that just the sound of you telling them different words, like where do you think Greta would go? And you can help find that. But then also you might even have pictures laying around the house of those people. And so then you build the literacy, you make it really look like a book, even stapling the side of it makes it feel like a book. Right now we're working on (laughs) not an ABC book of our family. Um, We are working on a graphic novel together about a zombie llama, which definitely was not my... (laughs) topic of choice, but it was fun to have conversations about, you know, at first the story was going to be about this zombie llama. And then I said, well, who would, you know, who would he go up against if he's the protagonist, who's the antagonist? And my son said a duck because a duck could, you know, resist his spit. But then he realized a duck is probably a better protagonist. So the whole story turned on its end. And for days, it was just talking about it, you know, and now we're drawing and we're sketching things out and we're just having fun with it. And it is now kind of the lexicon of our house. We're all in the house together all day. And we probably say zombie llama 
70 times, you know, during the day, but, but play into kind of those conversations that you have because they do become story. That's so interesting. And you can do that thing. You can do that exercise with any age child. As young as, you know, the ABC uh, group to the kids who are really into zombie animals. Sure. (laughs) It's it's a good point to make because I think a lot of times when parents talk, talk about or think about reading to their children or helping their children love books, they think about books that are professionally uh, written and, and illustrated and published. But um, yeah. it's also kids can learn to love to read through the creation sure. of their own stories and their own books. And I think about, you know, those collaborative books that we make in the classroom. My kiddos, you know, we had vast libraries in our classrooms, but the stories that they picked again and again, I had a a little bin that had our class made stories. And sometimes they were when we'd all work on a project together, like an ABC book or a fact book about the rainforest and everyone took a different piece. And sometimes they were just a collection of maybe their essays that were just bound together. It made it feel like a book. And those were the books that they really went to and and would read again and again um, and comment about. And certainly, wouldn't it be exciting to do that with lots of your family members right now? We have email still. They could send part of the story to you and you could, you know, put them together. They could attach a picture um, into that file and, and that could become part of the story too. So there's ways for us to still have those experiences, even though we're in the comfort of our own homes, <laughs> lucky enough to be. Yeah. So. That's really a compelling idea involving extended family members who are socially isolating at another location. Um, that's a way to do both sort of help your child think of himself as a, an author and right. begin to love stories and uh, have a new appreciation for books and also a way to perhaps learn about your family's stories uh, mm-hmm. and feel connected to those who are far away. Uh, yeah. you know, reading doesn't yeah. have to be reading and learning to love story doesn't have to be an isolating or a solitary experience. Right. And I think one of the things, um, you know, we were having a conversation uh, about school and about, you know, certain things that uh, Will was missing at school. And one of the things he was really disappointed about was the next day was library and he didn't get to, he had reserved a book already, but he didn't get to get that book. And um, there is this longing <laughs> for this book and we're just not able to purchase it right now. We're just not able to get it. Um but we've talked about all the books he's read. It's the Ranger in Time series, Kate Messner series. And we've talked about all the other books in the series now. And we've gone online to look at any of the previews about this book. So we're still trying to feed that flame of continuing the series, even though we don't really have access to it uh, right now. But I will tell you, Ranger in Time is helping us with our zombie llama because he really understands um, it's a very concrete structure to that story that he understands and and she's influenced that. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's great. I hope he gets his book soon. <laughs> <laughs> <Me too. laughs> so what other ways can we make reading a shared experience in this time of sheltering in place? Yeah, I, I think um, routine is also great. It's hard to find routine, but Is there a time when you read together? Is there a time when we all read silently? Even in um, our own books, it still feels like um, we're in it together when we're sitting next to each other with our own books. And then the discussion that we can have about story, um, what did you read, you know, during your time? And what what did I read? And and that becomes very nice. But I still think... um, finding the time to read together. Reading begets reading. Reading builds its own muscle. And that's whether you're being read to or you're reading on your own. And so finding those things that that you can, you can read aloud, um, that becomes a shared experience. And, and that's just as important as um, the reading on their own. And I think for really little kiddos, you know, setting, you can still set aside that reading time where you might be reading print on your own. And that kiddo might be looking at wordless books or might be flipping through books or a magazine and really just looking at kiddos' faces. And you can say, what did you read? Because that is reading at that level. Um, And there's still story to talk about, I think. 
after the fact. That's really interesting because I think a lot of times we don't think about kids who really aren't reading yet being able to have a silent reading time, but you've Mm. just shown us that they can. We just have to broaden our definition of some of these things, broaden our definition of reading even. Yeah. And I think, and in the Montessori classroom, that was one of our favorite ways to start the day when the kiddos would come in and they would kind of take care of getting their area set up and take care of themselves and their belongings. And then they would find a space in the room where they would like to read. Some of them would like to read to the goldfish. Now, my three-year-olds weren't really reading, but they might've known one of the words on the page, or it might've been a story that I read before and they knew kind of the, the flow of the story. So they were telling it to the goldfish, which is also really great. You might not have the bandwidth right now to hear the story, but your dog probably does. The goldfish might. Your grandmother via Skype might. Um, Your stuffed animals. Oh, I love the pictures that are on social right now with kiddos with their books and their little stuffed animals lined up, (laughs) you know, in front of them. Um, But there's, there's lots of ways to share story. And that's all a part of, of, um, reading. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And on the other end of the spectrum, older kids who are reading independently and quite well, um, they also like to be read aloud to. Oh, sure. <laughs> and how great to have that time together. I mean, um, I, I don't know about you. And I, I remember when, um, when I was breastfeeding, And I thought at first I was like, oh, you know, this is all I'm doing. This is all I'm doing. And it took a little while for me to be like, this is all I'm doing. What a great way to set up being a parent because yes, sometimes this is all I'm doing. And the reading, you know, with your child, it's okay. Like this is all I'm doing. All you're doing, you are creating a love of reading in your child. You are bonding. You are sharing a story together that becomes part of your dialogue going forward. Uh, we were watching a show on um, Will really likes called You Versus Wild, and he, you know, was like, "Mom, this is just like that book we read. Remember that book?" And he went down and he's throwing books around, and he found um, Chomp, the book Chomp, and he said, "It's just like this. It's just like this." So it's making those big connections in their world. And he wouldn't have picked that book up on his own, but having that together, he was able to make those connections. So I think all of that is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is all I'm doing. And this is huge. Right. (laughs) You know, in, in a world where so many of us feel like we're forced to multitask all the time, particularly busy families. I think we have to be very intentional about that. But that's a great mantra for for all of us. This is all I'm doing and it matters. Right, right. Big time. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, for some children, reading doesn't come easily or it does. And they just haven't yet found the right books and and they haven't really learned to um, love to read. So being asked to read silently for a period of time might seem more like punishment than an opportunity or a pleasure. Uh, What do you say to those parents who might have a child like that? Yeah, I think that's one, the readiness is definitely a piece of it. And two, interest. Interest is so important. I think schools do a really nice job and librarians certainly do a really nice job just having um, access to a wide variety of genres and really letting kids know that all reading is reading. Um, My son really could read, but he didn't want to read until um, he discovered Garfield comics, which there's a lot of censorship that needs to happen with Garfield comics. (laughs) But, you know, once he had those and he would ask questions, Garfield uses very enriching vocabulary, you know, but he was so motivated to read through them because he connected on a pretty deep level with Garfield. And that just spurred into everything. Then he was a reader and just very interested in reading. And so sometimes I think we discount the reading of magazines 
um, the reading of graphic novels, the reading of comics. Um, and that is a reading that speaks to so many kiddos. And so having access to things like that is important. Um, nonfiction can, can also feel that way. Sometimes I think people think, oh, nonfiction, is that prescriptive? Is that just for research? There's such beautiful nonfiction out there that um, for some kiddos, that's really what speaks to them. So I think giving that variety and giving the power to the reader to make those selections is really important. And then taking a step back, if it doesn't feel like that sustained quiet reading works, then it is time to do that reading together and maybe have other literacy rich experiences. Walk around, you know, when you can get outside and walk around, read signs together, um, read your environment together, make letters with Play-Doh, um, build, um, you know, a panel in your, you know, one of your windows, you can uh, steam up and write letters on there. You can, we used to call it backwards in my house. Will would lay on his stomach and I would trace words on his back. You know, like sometimes you rub your kids back to go to sleep and sometimes we would just do words on their back and, you know, he would guess. So there's ways to kind of still have that um, literacy richness, um, but then know that the stamina might not be there for a half hour of silent reading and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you can work up to that. Yeah. Yeah. Those are great suggestions. Are there any books that come to mind that might be particularly (laughs) timely for parents to share with their kids right now, assuming they could have them or couldn't get access to them? One of the, I, I I was just looking at uh, Dan Santat's Are We There Yet? Do you know that book? I don't think so. So I, I was actually looking, trying to look for some books. Um, there was a book that I did in, in the classroom, I mean, a million years ago, and it was called The Year I Didn't Go to School or The Year We Didn't Go to School. And it was about traveling um, with their family. And I, I couldn't find the book. But then I found another book that I used an awful lot in the classroom, which was Dan Santat's Are We There Yet? And that book is really about being in the present. It's about finding your way to the present and not trying to worry too much about what lies ahead, but being able to be comfortable with where you are right now. And of course, it's set up. You can guess where that question starts (laughs) in the backseat of a car, (laughs) right, on a trip. And so it's, it's tangible in that that question has come up, but the messaging behind it and the packaging of this book is stunning. When you take the dust cover off, it's an actual present, like a gift, because the present is a gift. I mean, the layers and the messaging behind it, it's highly interactive. You have to turn the book around at one point. Um, But that's one, and I was just on the shelves the other day, kind of looking for this other book and came upon that and thought, wow, this, yeah, this one. And I think it's a great time too, to engage with Um, writers, authors, and illustrators who are posting some read-alouds online. Um, There's wonderful resources. School Library Journal did a a great write-up of of authors and illustrators who are sharing their work um, and read-alouds, you know, that you can engage with. Yeah. That's a great suggestion. And and is there any one place where a parent might go to um, find some of those videos? Yeah, um, the School Library Journal has a nice link set set up there. Okay. Yeah, um, and then uh, if you if you um, look, Instagram is doing. I think it's called Reading at Noon. I think if you do a search, but Instagram is showcasing readers at noon as well, and they have some pretty high profile uh, uh, readers doing some story time with kiddos. And also don't forget your local library. I know our local library is doing amazing things. They love our kiddos. They know each of our kiddos by name. And, um, you know, they they have story time, which they used to have in the library at 10 a.m. Now it's a virtual story time. And then they're doing a tuck you in at bedtime and it's live on Facebook or reading to tuck kids in at bedtime with a read aloud. So your local resources are still there for you. That's a good reminder because I think we all heard libraries are closing. And so for some of us, it might've been out of mind, but they're still there to serve us. Yeah, of course. Librarians are the best. 
Well, Allison, this has been really helpful. Um, I appreciate your taking the time to share your tips with parents who are at home and uh, with their kids and who want to um, find the silver lining in this. And at Highlights, we say there is a silver lining. There is an upside. This is an opportunity for us to make some wonderful memories with our kids. It's an opportunity to um, find the time or take the time that we've always been looking for to read more with our children. And, um, you know, we want to remind everybody that even though we're all stuck at home, uh, reading really does take you places. It sure does. Yeah. And our kiddos are going to remember this time. This is going to be a part of their history. And um, we have an opportunity to make it really special for them. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. For show notes and information about other episodes in our podcast series, visit us at loveofreading.highlights.com. My name is William, and I'm eight years old. I love to read because you can learn anything from books.